Hey. Oh, let me put my headphones on, which are right here, because I need to hear myself. They're not allowed to have my guests are not allowed to be in the studio with with, with microphone um, headphones on. That's just for us uh, special DJs of some sort. You've entered the cosmic radio receptors of KFUG 101.1 FM in Crescent City, California. Let me adjust my squeaky, squeaky microphone there. I'm Jacques Kepner and the host of this show called Jacques Talks. And no, we will not be talking jock subjects and sports. You've reached... <laughs> I, guess, I got a guest laughing here. You're tuned in to KFUG, your sports leader. This is Jock Talk. An amalgamation of every sports yeah. announcer ever. There we go. <laughs> hey, not knocking sports. One day we will have a uh, some sport people on sh- the show, I'm sure. Maybe a coach or two. But that is another day. Instead, each and every Wednesday at 1 o'clock, I'll be talking with local folks and characters that make up our northernmost magical coastline such a very special place. If you're tuned in and listening, uh, either live, rebroadcasting, or live streaming, count yourself lucky that you have such a fantastic community radio station as KFUG to serve you 24-7 with a rich assortment of unique programming. And it's not just listening, it's getting involved with your local voice. Volunteer. Contribute. Donate your time and money to a non-profit. Let's put, I say that a great non-profit 501c3 foundation. And we are non-commercial. Yahoo. I love that. Uh, check us out on kfugradio.org. Reach out and tell us about our shows, programs, and community work. Also, if you have a noble cause that benefits all of us here in this community, let us know, and we will help you spread the word with a PSA, a public service announcements. It's easy, we are accessible, and we are here for you. Again, kfugradio.org, 101.1 FM on your dial. Get down on it. Mm, 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 get down on it. All right. Yeah, there we go. I love this. I am now, uh, okay, I have some really interesting guests in the um, uh, studio today, rather spontaneously. Um, uh, if you've ever attended the Methodist Church, that venerable, old, beautiful, semi-Gothic stone church that sits on the corner of H and 7th, um, you'll, you'll know what I'm talking about. That Methodist Church um, is served by a fiery, lady preacher by the name of uh, Reverend Dana Gill. And she, by the way, was my first guest on Jacques Talks, what, eight, nine weeks ago, and it was fantastic. Well, that Reverend Gill has a whole lot of loving to dispel about what Jesus was and who and what he said. Fantastic. I highly recommend you go to church. Nine o'clock, is it, Dana? Yes, nine o'clock. Starts. Nine o'clock every morning, uh, every Sunday morning. Uh, but... <laughs> The, the purpose, she's not here. She'll come back on my show again. But uh, behind this big grand piano throughout the service was a phenom uh, in every sense of the word. He is a most talented pianist and composer and super gifted musician. I want to welcome David Sedgwick. Hey, man. Hi there, Jacques. How's it going? Good, man. We are, we've connected since that early day, uh, that, that early Sunday when we came in, the dog, good doctor and I, and we mm-hmm. hung out mm-hmm. and heard that great sermon. And then your music was over the top. <laughs> Thank you. It really is. And I, so I have a lot of interesting things to ask about your um, your 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 whole, how you look at music and what music is to you. Because folks, he really is an incredible um, uh, pianist and composer. And just just wait till you hear what this guy does. And we'll try to make that without any piano music in the background. Mm. Well, I'm hearing it in my head. I hope the listeners are doing the same. <laughs> <laughs> that other laugh was Dr. Gigi, who's joined us in the studio too. And the reason I brought you together, there is a, ma- a method to my madness, but we'll get to that in just a few minutes. Uh, David um, um, is doing studio work for me on my exit, my intro and my mid and my exit music. Mm-hmm. And he's going to provide me with an original score and sound that will frame in each uh, of uh, each week's uh, Jacques talks. 
So really, this is this is a special time. So he came in today that we talked about that for about 13 seconds, <laughs> <laughs> but we still did. And uh, so let's get right to business. So so David, how you're? I assume you're in your 30s. Or just, I am. Yeah, okay, I'm 32. About All to right. be 33, I guess. All right. Long. So young, talented beyond belief, and a super super dedicated guy. How long has uh, Crescent City been your home? You've been living there. I just rounded the five year mark earlier this month. The five-year mark that you've been living that in. I've been living here in Crescent City. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So what I have to lead into next, and this will be my last story because this is this show is about about you too, not so much your host at this point. I I gotta tell you the story. Your mother was <laughs> gotta tell them. <laughs> Hi, I'm Meredith. bracing myself here. <laughs> Hi, Meredith. I think you've heard Hi, this Mom. before. <laughs> <laughs> Meredith is listening, and she's a super talented flutist and singer, and that's what I know her as. I mean, mm-hmm. just a ma- and now she's playing cello, and she's she's taking French. Uh, my goodness gracious! And oh, she's, she's the top scorer in uh, Duolingo, I think, across the the entire oh, North continent. My <laughs> so my short, quick story that I have to retell again, if you missed the story, is it's so hilarious about. Three weeks ago, four weeks ago, when I had a birthday, uh, the good doctor bought me a beautiful Yamaha flute, and I now needed lessons because I was just squawking on it. And so I went in and I talked to David about it. He says, "Hey, talk to my mom, Meredith. She'll 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 hook up. She's a she's a flute uh, she's a flute uh, uh, teacher." Mm-hmm. Oh. So I walked right in and I met Meredith. I'd seen her singing and stuff like that at the church services at 9 a.m. every Sunday at the Methodist Church. But when I walked into her and I said, hey, Meredith, I want you to teach me flute. And she said, sure, I could do that. And I said, but here's the deal. I don't want any theory. I don't want any note learning. I don't want to learn how to read oh, big read music. And there was this gigantic cosmic silence. And then she says, well, that's not going to happen. <laughs> that's just not how it works. That's just not going to happen. So you are my student. I, you're not the teacher, are you? Uh, she caught me with my proverbial pants down. And I went, oh, my goodness. Okay, what do you want me to do? She says, just show up next week. And we're going to start learning theory, uh-huh. notes, and how to read <laughs> Put you in your place music. right quick, didn't she? She <laughs> put me in my place right quick. I kind of delivered that wrong, uh, but it, it was a hysterical uh, time. So since then, I have been a very, very good student. I hope. <laughs> well, she tells me, she always kind of pats me on the head. Very good, Jackie. Uh, uh, welcome to my childhood, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what is it like growing up under a mom like uh, Meredith? She's a great uh, dynamo. It, 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 she, she is a, a powerhouse for sure, a force of nature. Um, there, there's a running joke within my family that, uh, you know, we were all musicians. All the kids were musicians. And the joke is that we weren't asked if we wanted to play an instrument. It was, which instruments do you want to play? <laughs> <laughs> and thankfully, I chose um, those couple of choices for myself at an early age. Um, I sat down at the piano before I even remember sitting down at the piano. And it just kind of made sense to me. And my grandfather was a wonderful pianist and a music educator as well, just like my mom uh, ended up being, and my brother and my sister as well. Um, And he taught me in my early years until it was clear that I was going to be too much of a nuisance for him. So they got me a a teacher outside of the family because apparently we are much more disciplined when we're not bucking against the family structure. Um, And then I got a trumpet for my fifth Christmas. And uh, there was just something about the piece uh, by George Gershwin, American in Paris, with that solo that that whistles across the top in the middle. It's so good. And trumpet became my next love and my vehicle for education, really, because I found that uh, I got into college on both trumpet and piano uh, for my undergraduate, and it was just too much work. And (laughs) it really was. I mean, I was in nine different ensembles and practicing five hours a day and trying to, you know, maintain a social life. And it was just, I, I was sleeping two and a half hours a night maybe whoa so i dropped the piano major and uh, because everybody and their mother plays piano right and fewer people can play the trumpet at a high enough level to get scholarships so that's what i did wow okay so this is this this you have a lot of credentials behind you and again literally every week as the musical director at the united methodist church Mm -hmm. and other i know you've, you've had concerts and things like this so you're always putting on it basically a show each once a week. 
Uh, yeah, more or less. I mean, it depends on your definition of show, I suppose. Well, <laughs> again, it, it's it's kind of non-typical because we have the the music worship mm-hmm. at the church, and it says, and you get into it, and that brings me up to the next thing is what you sometimes say. Last week, you said just before you started your piano playing and this was all original stuff right mm-hmm. yeah sure. mo- most of the time um I, I will improvise on a a subject so he folks yeah. he improvises <laughs> he's incredible well i actually did you know I, that Gigi? did you know he's totally improvising it i'm making it up as i'm going mm-hmm. well I, I really like the term that you used before we got on the air Spontane. here you call it spontaneous composition right oh, yeah. which yes no, not only does it sound much more you know judicious but um yeah no it, it does feel much more like composing in real time and responding to the ideas that just sometimes happen you know and it it very rarely feels like i have a plan beyond a feeling uh, interesting. Yeah. You have a brother that's um, that is a what is a band member or he's a band uh, director. He's the, he's the director of the um, the band program over at the high school here. The in Del Norte Warriors. Used, uh, yes, that's right. The Del Norte Warriors. He wow. used to uh, conduct the choral program as well for singing. Um, that recently split off into its own separate program with its own unique teacher, uh, Colin Kirkwood. Wow. Um, but yeah, no, he he's been a figurehead in the musical community here for fourteen years now. I think he's been. Here. Uh, he directs the Wild River Symphony Orchestra, which is an amateur wow. uh, orchestra that that plays a couple of concerts every year. Cool. Yeah, it's it's an amazing group. I play with them um, either on trumpet or piano, whatever is kind of required. But, uh, yeah. A trip is, is trumpet too loud to play in the church? Um, well, <laughs> so no, I don't believe so. I've played pretty loudly. You know, pretty good uh, acoustics in there. Oh, for sure. And it's very much like the the room becomes your instrument beyond you know just the instrument you're holding. Um, wow. With acoustics like that. So you said, okay, I, I, before I tell you what you said last week, before we were literally once again weekly blown away by <laughs> this incredible just piano playing that you do is so complex so fluid so uniquely expressive uh it makes us hold our hands and squeeze and just go whoa this is this is amazing but what you said just prior to your saying this is a piece i'm putting i'm playing i'm thinking of geometry mm. i'm thinking of ge- sacred geometry is that what you said the word? yes the yeah sacred geometry yeah the, so I, I kind of come up with an effective title um at the you know, at the podium, more or less. Right then um, and there. And the, the idea is structured but amorphous until I really put a name to it. And yeah, uh, geometry was kind of what I was feeling that day. A feeling yeah. geometry. I'm an, yeah. I'm an English major. You know, mm-hmm. I got my degree. Huh? I don't <laughs> think in geometry. Yeah, but, but you think in think words, in, do you not? I think in words, absolutely. Yeah, right. So the abstract of it. Yeah. And I and I hear the giggling over here uh, <laughs> to your, to your uh, is it your left? Uh, huh, the my Dr. left, your right. Name. Dr. Gigi. And that is... Uh, we were going to talk, have her on this for this hour, but because David's such an accomplished musician and is local and is contributing to our community here in Crescent City, it was just a natural bring him on, get him in here, and put him on the air. So we kind of backpedaled a little bit with Gigi and I, and that is we were going to talk about, what were we going to talk about? Oh, we were going to talk about the, the layers of human anatomy, and um, we were going to talk about the human design and its layout, meaning the skin, which is, what, what's the skin again? Skin's the largest a, organ. The mm-hmm. largest organ, okay. The muscular. I didn't know that it is our, our organs, is, is every muscle, what is, what is a muscle? Uh, every muscle is an organ. Every, every muscle so is an organ. If you think about it, every clump of cells that works for something is an organ. So every muscle is an organ. Because how many muscles do you know? How many muscles we have in our body? Uh, Five hundred seven hundred forty-four. Some. Oh, I thought it was in the five hundred thirty-fours. Well, I can't tell them. Okay, all how, many how many bones? Two hundred six. Two hundred. How many? Six. Two hundred six. Okay. <laughs> See, the guy's not only a trumpet player, pianist, but now he's, he's. I know exactly how many muscles are in the human body because I. Well, I, I was just watching an episode of the X Files earlier today. <laughs> <so, yeah. laughs> well, okay. Uh, well, I mean, if you can't get your scientific data from somewhere. <laughs> oh my goodness! Then underneath that, we have the skeletal, the bones, mm. and what they do, and then the cardiovascular system, which is the veins and the arteries 
arteries uh, and the, what is it, the lymphat- lymphatic Lymphatic uh-huh. system mm-hmm. that a lot of people forget when we're talking about the little plumbing, the blood plumbing in our body. So our hormone delivery systems too, yeah. The what? The hormone delivery systems. Yeah, the yeah. hormone, yeah, the, the blood is also mm-hmm. the hormone delivery yeah. system. Yeah. That's exactly right. Dr. David and Dr. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for having me on. Yeah, <laughs> The organs and then the blood and then our, our heart and oh we we were we were going to go down that but it's okay because what this brought to mind and now I'm going to come back full circle to to why I have these two on the air with me is um, there is a method to my madness and that is a thing called synesthesia mm-hmm. synesthesia. Um, Synesthesia. Do you have a quick reference for that? Yeah. Yeah. So that's a neuropsychological thing that happens in some people, where two in, uh, two inputs in the brain associate with two things. So, for example, or or different inputs associate with different things. So, just for crossed example, sensory experiences, right? Doubly. Mm, yeah. So yeah. So for example, I have the perception of colors and numbers so that's how i see i see colors and numbers and and numbers and colors for Mm -hmm. example so that's mine which is just simple apparently Mm -hmm. well and and mine mine is also pretty simple and straightforward i i more or less see what i hear you see what you hear okay wait a minute let's back this down wait a minute i'm the one that said this word synesthesia Mm -hmm. what i I, that wasn't for a lay person like myself what the hell are you talking about (laughs) seeing numbers but it's something similar like this what what what, how i see it with Gigi. when you see the color orange you don't see orange you see a number well you said that was a 26 didn't you yeah 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 so here no it's a 24 oh 24 so up here just above me is like this perfect orange which is in Mm. my mind a 24 24 and orange is the same so i don't see 24s floating around i see the orange and i associate 24 with it Mm -hmm. and and similarly when when i hear a specific key in music i associate a color with it like e major which is incidentally the key of uh the the little tune that i played for you that you liked for your show um is all greens and whites oh my good you know there was another famous guy i remember that had synesthesia Mm -hmm. And, well, his name's Albert Einstein, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. Yeah, he was, yeah. We'll talk was... about coincidence here, Jacques. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or is it? <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's like a, I have no clue what you are talking about. Your mother mentioned the other day, she says, she sees grooves in everything. And I thought, grooves? What do you mean? She says, like grooves in my brain as I'm learning something. Uh-huh. I'm putting it into a groove. I'm seeing I'm seeing lines. I'm seeing grooves. And well, like, and, and I, I was thinking, actually, uh, just about synesthesia in general. And, and it just feels to me like an added layer of internal dialogue more than anything. You know, it's just internal an internal uh, dialogue. So yeah. just you thinking about your what you're you're the only master of your ship, right? You're Correct. not mine. And yeah. You're not hers. I'm not you. Right. And, and so you, you come up with your mind comes up with different visualizations or different other you know mechanisms to interpret your own learning process. Whoa. And so, you know, the, the grooves could very well be visual as well as just the feeling of, you know, synaptic connection, more or less. Whoa. So for the next five minutes, let's talk of the rel- uh, theory of relativity. <laughs> <laughs> sure. No, no, okay, it was a I joke. Take something. it back. Right, let's go grand unified. Take it I back. Say something okay. about the colors, which I think yeah, okay. I don't. Mm, my thought process is not that high. I'm just saying, for me, my favorite color is orange, right? Mm. And my and it's a 24. But my favorite number is 28. And what color is associated with that? Blue, turquoise, greenish, which is not my. So isn't that funny? It is. Hmm. You'd think that there would be a more direct... Yeah. yeah. And so then I looked up synesthesia from other people, and then they, they have kids draw the 1 through 10 in different colors, and then they draw a 1 in black, and I'm thinking... That's just plain that wrong. That is so wrong. <laughs> 1, obviously, is white. So can, can you give me a 1 through 10 color spectrum analysis no, here? No, there is no... But 99 is black. Okay. 17 is pale yellow. So so different numbers jump out at you yeah. with, with definite stark right. colors. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. How about you? What's your first yeah. top three? What is one, two, three for you? Um, so I don't see colors uh, associated with numbers, but I, I do have very strong key associations. F right? sharp. Like F sharp is all orange 
orange with some burnt reds and you know some Whoa. deep browns. Okay. This is getting... And D major is kind of a lighter, like beige-ish, but it has some other orange undertones to it. Um, like D flat major is purples and greens. It's it's all just a combination of, you know, what what things contribute to the the overall sense of color. So we're having a new meeting of synesthesias <laughs> synesthes- coming next uh, Sunday at the church. <laughs> if you are interested in learning more, come on down to the church and we could talk colors and shapes and numbers. It's just a uh, blows and my keys, yeah. it blows my mind. It's 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 over my head. I'm a college educated guy. I kind of think I'm smart, but when I start talking with this almost it seems almost genius level to me that you're seeing this. And coming back to David, what you said now makes more sense. When you sat at you were sitting at the piano and you said, "Okay, the worship began, your musical worship mm. and there you started it but before you said i see sacred geometry this mm-hmm. morning so here it is and you played that piece and you're saying you did that all spontaneously and it's yes unbelievable. yes but yeah. we were just we're, we're again the audience is like uh and if you want to see this guy do his thing come to the methodist church at 9 a.m on sunday the doc and i will be there absolutely and then you also get on top of that you get the super bonus of uh, reverend dana gill delivering one of her powerful messages absolutely so here we are at this and uh are we, oh, oh my god it's almost so we've almost run into a half hour of the show so that shows Just you how started. fast it goes <laughs> when we talk uh these things again it's over my head but it's not about me it's about you guys Anything else you want to talk about synesthesia before we move on? Feel free. So, so you see geometry when you play those keys. Well, so, so the um, the interface with music, um, as far as my understanding of synesthesia goes, uh, is beyond just color and and form. It's there, there's a whole world of of spatial relationships um, to music as I see slash hear it. So when when I when I think of geometry, for example, there is not only a um, an x and a y axis, but the z axis, and there's 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 stuff that's coming from behind me through me to the front. There's lateral kinds of ideas that float around, and so Whoa. the the kinds of um, uh, expressions or gestures that I was uh, using to accomplish what I thought was um, you know, geometry sonically um, was just kind of taking a shape and rotating it in space through sound. Um, and anybody who's ever seen me talk has heard me talk because I, I speak, you know, with my hands, very Italiano, right? And and, and I, I think very much the same way. There's always a tract of, of uh, some kind of forward to back and left to right. And when I get the chance to express that musically, it 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 just feels so much more playful Whoa. if you come from you know behind to front and so this on. This is in so a forth. whole whole another league. I just heard you talking French with Stephanie, who was leaving. Oh, I think everybody you. was talking. The doctor arrived, and she they were talking in French. Gigi speaks fluent French and German uh, and English better than I do as an English major. But you were talking, and you said you only took one semester yeah. of French. I studied for <laughs> one semester. Par un semestre à l'université. Oui, 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 oui. Yeah. Mm. I, uh, that that blows my mind. That shows you I'm I'm surrounded by geniuses here in the studio today, which is which is fantastic to hear this stuff. So that's the method to my ma- madness that I had to bring up synesthesia mm-hmm. to uh, bring this out, and uh, I, boy, it, I sort of get it. I sort of get it, David. I kind of get it. I'm, I'm just like I'm starting to kind of get the flute after two lessons now. I'm oh, slowly... speaking of genius. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm just no, absolutely not. I was blowing off every other one. I was, Oops, I forgot what I had down D's and C's. I was, I was texting your mom, darn it. I don't like the D's. A D and a C is too difficult to do. And she's showing me all these techniques about how to hold it. Okay, let's not talk about that. So, okay. So leaving synesthesia behind, we are at a perfect point to to run into my um, mid-show promo, which is just going to take a minute. And that is, I want to thank you all uh, out there, my all my listeners, to Jacques Talks. I'm Jacques Kepner, and your host for the remainder of this hour. The reason you are hearing this conversation is because I became a part of KFUG Radio right here in Crescent City, California, and and beyond. 
people are listening to us all over the world. Folks, I had an idea several months ago to get back into the broadcasting booth, and I pitched this show to my esteemed colleague, Paul Kritz, who was affectionately known as the station manager here and the man with the coolest voice in broadcasting. You've known him for quite a while, right? Um, uh, yeah, off, off and on. Yeah. I've you've been aware of him. <laughs> Yeah, you guys were talking, and you've been on you've been on the air before. You've been I have, yeah. I've been in the studio once before. All right, cool, cool. What I'm getting at is this: if I can do it, then you may very well be able to get into broadcasting too. If you have an idea for a show, pitch it to Paul. P I T P. Oh, okay, I'm starting to see colors. <laughs> <laughs> it, see, it only takes a matter of time. Whoa! I just I saw kind of a pinkish. <laughs> Orangish. Where did reddish, you get that cough yeah, drop? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> with red, what did you say? With red flaring on it? Oh, That's right. Yeah. A deep see, red. Burnt red. red. You see <laughs> flames every time I get mad. I I assure you that Hercules, although. Hercules, Hercules. <laughs> I can assure you that although Paul is a very busy and dedicated manager and broadcaster, he is approachable. Uh, he doesn't bite. On a similar note, KFUG is on your radio right now because of those folks who donate to this homespun local community radio like KFUG. Find out more by simply tuning in at 101.1 FM or uh, clicking on kfugradio.org. Now, uh, Doc, I got some questions. We're going to take a slight, a slight uh, uh, variation off uh, that I think is just fascinating. Uh, many of you know Dr. Uh, have seen her with me in, over the past uh, four, five, six months. And um, we, she's very approachable. She's very approachable. She's really cool. A lot of people always ask, what, you're, you're a doctor? Doctor what? She says, I'm a physician. I'm a doctor. She is her. She's an active uh, doctor working in Crescent City, California. But you're also a... Uh, a cancer survivor, right? Yes, I am. And what kind of cancer? Thyroid cancer. And I just had my, in, that was in 2007. I got my thyroid taken out and supposedly clear. Okay, so you saw, you had this cancer come up. You're still too young. I don't know, David, I'm sitting here looking. We're, we're talking kind of older folks. <laughs> Oh, no, I'm, I'm taking copious notes. Here. <laughs> he is, he's writing, he's taking them in geometric symbols. <laughs> Einstein. I'm not Egyptian. <laughs> <laughs> and he, uh, he, so you had your thyroid taken out. And what's really interesting, I'm a, I'm a kidney cancer survivor, knock on wood, 22 years now. I've been cancer free after being diagnosed with extremely deadly kidney cancer. So there's been a reason why, here, I'm going to knock on my head right now. Solid brain in there, <laughs> or is it wood? I'm not sure. And that is, so we're both can, uh, cancer survivors. But what I want to, this, this is the twist, folks. Here it is. How do you think you got cancer? Me, ask me. One word, one word, yes. Chernobyl. Did you say Chernobyl? <laughs> yes, I think Chernobyl is probably the cause for my cancer. When was it? Uh, Chernobyl in April twenty sixth. April twenty sixth, nineteen eighty six. Nineteen eighty six, in which, Ukraine, eighty yeah. miles north. Of, I thought it was Russia, but then I guess it was Russia it back was in eighty six, right? Duh. Yes, I think so. Yeah. So, so Chernobyl is just ninety miles, eighty miles north of Kiev. Yeah, we're hearing about. So you're tell us your story you're in germany at the so time so i was in germany well i grew up born and raised in germany and i was at the university of konstanz which is in germany studying and um so that was end of april and may 1st was is, is a german holiday and everybody goes on their first picnic and going out and biking and whatnot the night before it rained and so sunday I think it was Sunday or whatever, uh, May 1st, we went out. And then the next day, my boyfriend at the time, I think he went for his uh, PhD or something at the time, he came, uh, called me or ran to me or whatever. He said, somebody spilled radioactivity outside. Oh, he worked what, with he had a Geiger counter? Or something? Uh, yeah, he worked with radioactivity and he walked around with a Geiger counter and there was background noise ever with a blah, 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 blah. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and so then they held it to the window, and it was it was strong there. And he said, "Oh my gosh, somebody spilled radioactivity!" And they tried to figure out what happened. And um, a few days later, then the Chernobyl 
was the news that they could the Russians couldn't deny it. At first, right, they denied yeah. it, as I recall. They they denied it, and okay, so that's that was that's a big 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 thing. That's a weird twist that you would you'd consider it. That was maybe one of the reasons why, because you weren't that terribly far away from it, and then it drifted down and got in the rain clouds and yeah, maybe came and down popped and popped down, and it is known to cause uh, thyroid cancer. That, that radio so it too. manifested that many years later. What, yeah, like it can manifest 20, up to yeah, 20, twenty years, years. later, which mm-hmm. you just told me this fascinating story. That, that that happened. Do you know of other people? I guess that have had. I do not oh, actually. Okay. I don't. I don't. I you mean, not followed. personally. I don't know anybody. Else. Well, you came to the states so you, next year, right? You left. Germany. Yeah, I came in '87. Correct. So you came then, and so, wow. We were talking real quickly about your uh, organs. I always, I, I'm fascinated by the skin. It's the largest. It's the largest organ, and yet it's so weird. Some people have just horrific issues with their skin. Other people just. It's just it's just a bizarre thing. This this skin covered with how many like thirty layers of dead cells is your yeah. is your outer dermis? Yeah, that keeps our skin unattractive to invaders like bacteria or such. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's dead skin, no water. Nobody wants to live there unless we cut it, and then it's moist and warm and attractive to Ooh, all kinds all of invaders. All sorts of warm we down there. We talked about bacteria. Viruses. Oh yeah, okay. About the spider biting, David. Do you see many spiders in uh, Crescent City? Um, see sometimes. Yeah. Feel <laughs> the seen. next day after they've bitten me. <laughs> yes, more often. <laughs> Maybe a mosquito. I have never seen. I mentioned this with a doctor a few weeks ago. I've never seen more spiders in my life than <laughs> Crescent City in the world, and I've traveled pretty well. There are trillions of spiders in her backyard and just laying in the weeds and the lawn. They're everywhere. So, doctor, it's not a, the bite or spite, the bite that gets into you. It's more of what? So usually people think they got a spider bite, although they have never seen the spider actually biting. So usually when you go to the ER or such and you have a red dot or the skin is kind of just red or welted or whatever, it's not really treated for spider venom, antitoxin or whatever. It's usually an antibiotic against the skin flora because we're covered with bacteria. So if this, the thought is the spider bites. All it did was provide a way for the bacteria yeah. to get into the system. Yep, yep, yes. yep. Mm-hmm. So and then, okay, so, and then the same thing can happen with uh, mosquitoes, right? Yeah, Did same I get thing. You? Yeah, that little tiny minute. Well, the sp- the 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 little tiny minute mosquito, they put actually when they suck our blood or whatever they're sucking out of it, they put something in there so it doesn't. That gives us the reaction. That's the mm-hmm. itchy and and wilty and. I used to live in Houston, where there were oh, I think 190 God. different species of mosquitoes, <laughs> and each one of them had their own thing that they used to do. And and like I think 16 of them would, when they bit you, inject into your bloodstream uh, uh, some kind of pheromone that you would start sweating out your pores and attract <laughs> other attract members others. of those mosquitoes to come. Oh, it's like, hey, no. this is a prime target. <laughs> yeah, I'm one of those guys. I, I don't. She doesn't get bit. We'll, we'll be in back here playing bocce ball uh, or something you and, and me both we're the sweet oh <laughs> sweet ones oh my god and suddenly she was like what, what, what mosquito there's 40 of them on my mm-hmm. chest so like, you look ah. like constellations yeah, if you they, stay they, out too long enough. they unbutton my shirt I'm like ah, get, get them right there because you wear long sleeves just because of that 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 blows my mind so so doctor what's your favorite organ my favorite organ is probably the kidney. A kidney. So that's my issue that I had. Yeah. I I think it was my favorite organ before, but that would probably make it my favorite <laughs> organ right now. Folks, we're talking live medicine here with synesthesia <laughs> expert David Sedgwick here on Jaw Talks. We're way over my head, but we don't care. Why do you like the ki- well, kidneys? I'll tell you why I like the kidneys, because so... Organs are cell clumps that work together for function of some sort. Now the kidneys have so many functions, mm-hmm. which is, I think, absolutely amazing. Number one, they are the main organs. They are the organs for our blood pressure to control our blood pressure. Wait a minute, our blood pressure is controlled or influenced by the our kidneys. kidneys. Yeah, Whoa, that's pretty cool, that. right? Most people don't know about that. I think that's really cool. Um, it gives our bone marrow the go ahead of making new blood cells so wait, oh yeah wait a minute stop i'm sorry what uh, feedback system is that <laughs> <laughs> 
we are we are our our all of our blood cells are created inside of our bones. Is this yeah. correct? Yep. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh. Do you know any of this? I'm, 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 I'm I, yeah. Go figure. So you mean inside of our closed off, our hardest these bones? What's the hardest thing in our mouth? Our, 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 our teeth, right? But yeah. after that's our bones. Bones. And you're saying inside it's the, the bones. It's the long bones that make. That, yeah, that make. The our long bones. bones. Mm-hmm. I mean, long and I think some flat bones like the ribs. Are, well, they're long bones too, but mm-hmm. they make long flat bones. Okay, if somebody wanted a marrow transport, a transplant, where do they take it from? They take like it bones. actually from our hips. The hips, right? Now. Yeah, mm-hmm. from the mm-hmm. os coxae, which is not where we think our hips are, except for anatomically, it's not the hips. Mm-hmm. Wow. So the, the, the butt bones, basically. The butt bones are getting, that's where they scrape out or they take out the yeah, marrow. Yeah, they go with the big old syringe. Okay, right where the piriformis, right? How does, how does the blood then come through? If it's made inside the bones, how does it? get out of the bones they're so dense or maybe no there's a lot a lot a lot a lot of blood vessels going in and out so they just get closing out and out it goes into the bloodstream highly perforated yeah yeah Yeah, when you think about it that's right i've seen the close-up images and it looks like a sponge almost Mm -hmm. right if you look at it microscopically yeah and so it just what diffuses out through the well this whole this whole sponge system is filled with blood and then it just oops and then it just goes out it's part of the they don't have to, you know, pack their satchel and go out. They are part of the blood system. So once it, the blood is there, how, do the, how does blood get oxygen to it, oxygenated? So that's what the lungs function is. They go to the lungs, um, and the oxygen that we breathe in then transfuses through to the blood vessels, and that's where the red blood cells, that's their function, mm-hmm. take up the oxygen and carry it around and let it go in the capillaries and um and then it diffuses okay all our one cells. more question about this and then we're going to kind of ping pong this back over to david's cut side well, now that we're talking about my field here yeah <laughs> well no but you seem to know quite a bit that's good i mean you're a bright 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 guy okay uh doctor one big question for you what is truly just just tell me as simple as i can i can uh, be, be explained tell me what is cancer what are you asking? I'm Wait. asking you. Oh, 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 okay. So cancer, very cool. It's it's super interesting. Mm-hmm. Cancer is when the cells don't stop dividing. Usually c- cells stop dividing when they touch another cell. Can- when cancer cells, that's overridden, so they just keep dividing and dividing. Huh? What is there, like a voice? <laughs> yeah. What is it, some voice that says do not... Yeah, it's a chemical, mm-hmm. it's a it's a biochemical impulse that said do not start this um, gene, do not read this gene that would tell the cell to make more cells. So what is cancer? Is it just a clump of overgrowing hungry cells? Yep, normal it's cells? A, yeah, so in the beginning, it's a normal cell that just has another baby cell or t- twin cell more and more and more and more. But it's not a normal cell because the impulse to stop growing or dividing is not given anymore. So it's not normal. And so the more and more and more cells we make, the more and more and more deteriorated the DNA, the information gets pretty soon at the at the end of a cancer cell, if the cancer is everywhere, it doesn't show anymore where it came from. So lung cancer stays, has lung cancer attributes for a little while, but then when it spreads around, at the end is just a cell that doesn't stop dividing, and it's not a lung cell per se anymore. Well, okay, and it metastasizes, which ma- ma- metastasizes. Ma- metastasize. Metastasize, yeah. okay. Dr. Dr. David, I like that one, <laughs> Dr. David. Well, so, so I mean, um, so two things. Um, is that the primary function of the damaged cell that causes it to replicate too far? Or, or is there something else? Because I know with like melanomas and other skin cancers, the radiation from the sun is what deteriorates the information that then gets copied um, ad nauseum, right? Well, what it does is the, the so the, um, the sunlight or other like radiation, from, uh, yeah, radiation exactly, right. like my thyroid, um, that puts damage into the dna and mm-hmm. if the damage is exactly at that point that actually tells the cell do not do stop dividing it's that then function that's yeah. and there are several of those but if those functions are stopped then there is no stop anymore so mm-hmm. they do keep 
dividing and dividing and dividing. Mm. And so while they're dividing so quickly, then the repair mechanism is not there anymore, and so right. they get out of right. control. Right. Yeah. So the other question I had, um, I was watching a fabulous little documentary on um, larger uh, mammalian species like elephants and blue whales that apparently cancer is not as critical of an issue for them, be something to do with the size of the systems at play within their bodies. But either way, like the number of deaths from cancer in the larger mammals is next to none. Whoa. So they're, they're, Whoa. Yeah, I was wondering I if you had ever heard anything about that. No, I haven't. Huh. You know, Although I saw so the cancers in other, I would say in other animals, is probably not not well understood because we live so long because we have right. all the other measures and the animals usually don't live longer than mm -hmm. when they're... When well, they're here's a plug so. for the... Sure. I'm not a vegan. Uh, we, we practice primarily a plant-based diet. Mm -hmm. Dr. and I have done so for years. But I, the big thing is larger animals, all the big, largest animals, talk about them, hippos, giraffes, elephants. The, who are the big boys? Uh, the water buffaloes, mm -hmm. all the big antelopes, all the things. They're all, what? They're all vegetarian. Herbivores, yeah. Herbivores, pardon me, yeah. that was the word, not omnivore. Or an omnivore is everything, and a herb... Uh, uh, what is yeah, it? Yeah, herbivore. herbivore. Yeah, herbivore, right? Grassivore. Yeah, and then a carnivore is meat. That's what I was trying to think. Carnivore <laughs> and omnivore is kind of both. Yes. Kind of spiders. You know, it's a blood <laughs> today. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. What, what is the term for only drinking blood? Uh, uh, just Draculani. Yeah, vampiric, right? No, <laughs> no, no kidding. Ah, ah, ah. Oh. <laughs> so they are the largest animals on earth. Don't eat meat. Oh, my goodness. Is, is krill a meat the smallest thing in the world is every time well no but i'm thinking of a like a a, a whale a oh whale, you're right, they're eating yeah. krill ah, yeah. you're right yeah. okay yeah. so that's the one big big oh, it's like poking the holes biggest, everywhere uh, <laughs> maybe the biggest <laughs> I, I forgot about the biggest animal in the world but hey yeah. talking about the land animals mm -hmm, okay sure. all right okay they otherwise they'd have to be eating <laughs> eating the seaweed all day mm -hmm. um trick up uh, okay doctor what is trichotillomania Trichotillomania Ooh. is a uh, psychological attribute from some people where they so have they to... They eat their own hair? Yeah, oh they God. have yeah. to pull... Dr. David, answer uh, the question. Very nice. Thank good. you. Yeah. They have to pull their hair... Pull it, that's right. And yeah. they're aware of it, and they just have to do okay, it. Okay, wait a minute. This is blowing my mind. You mean there's people that have like are obsessively pulling out their hair? Yeah. And it's called trick. Trichotillomania. Trichotillomania. And what happens? Is there such a thing as, as hair pain? Is there such a thing as hair? Can you have pain in your hair? Well, you can. well, in the follicle where it's seated to the scalp, sure. Yeah, if you pull it, it hurts. Yeah, so but like the, like uh, any yeah, other stimulus, right. though, if it's repetitive enough, you lose sensitivity. And then you get spotting of it, and then so when you see patients, uh, let's not say who you see, but but aren't there people that? try to hide this well what do they do wear hats yeah so or something? usually they are where they're pulling their hair and usually they have round spots where there is no hair because that's where they go and pull right. their hair and often they hide it with wearing beanies or hats of well well ours. answered okay okay dr d dr david oh, let's ask you this one for, <laughs> if like that's that. okay but that's uh, dr d and dr uh, yeah. g <laughs> d and g yeah darn good <clears throat> If you see someone coming in, Dr. D, if you see someone come into your office, and she should be a piano doctor and a musician and everything else, and their eyebrows are partially missing, their mm -hmm. eyebrows are partially missing, what do, would you associate that with? Oh, they were just camping. <laughs> 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 what does camping have to do with your eyebrows? Oh, if you're getting right up into the bonfire on a, on a nice cold night. Uh, come on, this, that's an easy one. Give me a hard one, Jacques. <laughs> <laughs> All right, stop, stop, right there. Okay, you did pull that one off. Okay, right, Dr. G, what, if someone walks into you and their eyebrows are partially missing, what do you see? What does that alert you to? Well, if they're missing from the outside in, then that is associated with hypothyroidism or mm -hmm. trichotillomania. Oh, they could be pulling it out too. Yeah. So the people like twist their mu men sometimes twist their, their mustache. mustache. Oh, it's one of life's greatest pleasures. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's right. You got a big mustache too. We both. Well, I'm not. I, I keep mine trimmed pretty low. What a trip! And so, um, uh, this the, it's basically mental pain that is overcome by what physical pain? Is Compulsive uh, stimulation, right? Yeah. yeah. So, so the the thought is that mental pain. They want to feel. They want to 
something stronger than the mental pain so the physical pain takes over it overrides that mental pain so that's the thought yeah well and and i, I know other just you know auto compulsive kind of tendencies like i i'm a i'm a twitcher you know i i chew on my cheek when i'm thinking oh. I, I chew on my tongue when i'm thinking Can you, does it hurt you i mean you're like what, it sometimes hurts, it, it depends on how vigorously and for what length of duration you know it's so like sometimes if i'm especially when i don't sleep the tendency gets a little bit more exact Exacerbated, and so I'll just be chewing on my tongue until it's you know bloodied. Whoa, <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa! Or sometimes yeah. when I get that, like if you bite your cheek, and a few mm-hmm. days later it's still, and you want to kind of kind of kind of bite on it again to kind of oh, yeah. hurt. What the hell is that all about? What's a mental mental pain? You're trying to overcome it by physical pain. Does that lead to something deeper? Yeah, like the com- yeah, that's what it yeah often is. No, if you you have heard about people who cut themselves sure. like no the, not really the... but i have heard of, yeah yeah so that is certainly mental pain that they try to overcome by physical pain it's, oh. it's or, very common so I, or i've also heard you know discussion around the topic where it's more of a control uh, impulse you know, if you feel out of control emotionally or intellectually, you, yeah. you do something where you control the sensation that you're experiencing. And physical pain is a very acute way of accomplishing that. Oh, boy, I haven't lived these lives here. There's lots to not to talk about. These are just some, some of the issues. There's some of the fun things that I'd written down that we could talk about. Bringing it back to, back on the ping pong um, uh, we're on here today. Back to Dr. David here in the, in the studio. I want to ask you... Who, since you compose a lot of your stuff in your own head, mm-hmm. and um, and who's your favorite composer? Is it somebody? Are there multiple ones that just you like, or were you more classic? Have I ever heard of any of these people? Um, I hope so, because they they are some of the most um, transcendent classical composers I know. Rachmaninoff, Sergei, uh, a Russian composer around uh, the turn of the twentieth century. Um, Maurice Ravel. Also in the 20th century, both Rachmaninoff and Ravel are, without a doubt, the best orchestrators of their time and anybody else's. Um, Gustav Mahler, a German composer from around the same time period. It, it was it was clearly the heyday of classical music was from between 1880 and, and a few of them were kind of German, right? Some of them. Oh yeah, oh, Ma- yeah. Gustav Mahler. <laughs> you think so? Like, yeah, yeah, just a few. Uh, also Beethoven, Beethoven yeah. Bach, yeah, Beethoven, uh, mm-hmm. and, and uh, Schubert was Schubert. Uh, Schubert, yeah, Franz. Yeah. Oh my goodness, yeah. gosh, well, just a few. I mean, yeah, the, the, the I mean Austria and Germany and uh, going all the way up to London. You know, just the, the Euro- European composers between 1800 and present day have always just carried that mystique, you know, and that, that entrenched kind of education. You know, Johannes Brahms was, was one of those people that that always felt sh- overshadowed by Beethoven until he figured out his own compositional style. It was just so, so dogmatic, you know, their world. So back to it. Mahler, Rachmaninoff, Ravel. Debussy is cute. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I like Debussy. But one of his only like really cool pieces is La Mer, the ocean. Hmm. Um, and then I'll go with Francis Poulenc for number five. Who was that? Francis what? Francis Poulenc. Poulenc, huh? Yeah, so yeah. Most of these are going over my head, but Drawing that's okay. A here. Yeah, yeah no, he he's he's kind of an underrated and underrecognized French composer. He was one of the five, um, if you you know, know that term, uh, Mio Poulenc, uh, Ravel. Uh, and he is just so quintessentially French, it's painful. <laughs> you know, just all, all of his little uh, little voice leadings and um, gestures are just, like I said, quintessentially wow. French. Well, okay, so getting it, updating it to who's your favorite jazz artist or a couple? Bill of... Evans, no question. The who? Bill Evans. Bell Bill Evans. Yes. Jazz, okay, there we go. How about blues? You like blues? You listen oh, to yeah, blues? of course. Um, blues people you like to listen oh, to. Oh, man. Or how about rock? We'll put a you know. Who's rock. your favorite rock artist? Couple. You know, I, I like I really like Jordan Rudis. Um, he's a, a keyboard player. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so all right, I'm writing this one yeah. down. I'm jo- go. Jordan Rudis. R U D E S S. R U D D S S. Yep. He played uh, he played synthesizers for the Liquid Tension Experiment, which eventually became Dream Theater. Um, he's been all over the world. Uh, really, really good. Um, I like Petrucci. He's a little show offy for me. He's a guitar player. Petrucci? Petrucci. P E T R U C C I. 
Okay. All right. We're just, I'm thinking he's going to say the Beatles for sure. No, the Stones. <laughs> oh, no, throw on Led Zeppelin. Hey, Come I, I, on. I do love the Who. Oh, Zeppelin? <laughs> Anytime, man. Led and Zeppelin? Queen, let's go. Okay, Freddie Queen, Mercury. Yeah. That one. Uh-huh. There yes. we go. We've heard that Woo-hoo. one. Yeah. Hey, by Part the way, next them. next week, uh, I'm so excited. I have, uh, I have Mike and Teresa Powell coming in. And so many of you know Mike as the, as the super... He plays a different guitar rhythm and a different guitar playing all together because he plays some of the hard licks mm-hmm. that uh, Led Zeppelin and we'll, we'll talk about it more week uh, uh, next week. Yeah, and he's, he and his family are so cool oh, and yeah. with Bloodline mm-hmm. um, with Josh and Jared and, and of course Teresa said so the both of them will be in the, 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 the studio next week and we will hear Mike um, acoustically playing. I wish you could almost get on that piano and play something, Dave, Doctor D. But I think it's it was a few. It's kind of beat up. It, it is a little bit beat up. I'm happy yeah. to tickle it if you'd like to. <laughs> yeah. Oh, can you play play that play that lick? Can oh, you just want a little something? Yeah, yeah. I don't okay. Care. Now wait a minute. Let's pick up his microphone and ex- extend oh, no, his. It, it, it'll pick up just fine. How about that lead-in? Play the lead-in that I liked. You're tuned into KFUG, your sports leader here on Jock Talk. Smooth jazz and sports. <laughs> Smooth. Isn't that cool? Yeah. He played, he played that. Okay. Yeah. Well, there are four keys that don't fire, okay. but you know. Yeah, there's <laughs> lots of keys that don't play, but Don, um, uh, Paul Paul was always said, hey, man, you know, if you want the, want the thing, you could have it. And it's like, hey, I might take it up. And then we had Richard come in, the guy that is the piano Oh, yeah. No, I, I know Richard well. You know Richard? Young, oh, yeah. young man. Right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, Richard's a good guy. He's the one who sold me my, my piano. And he said, yeah, mm-hmm, yeah. He might have more, more cost than getting it. You get it, but it's, but it's free. It's mm-hmm. free. Hey. Yes, well, free free isn't always free, Jacques. <laughs> uh, that's true. It isn't always. Uh, doctor has an identical twin named Rika, who's listening oh. in. By the way, Rika reached out to me. She's listening oh, yeah. in from Hi, BYU. Shula. I mean, hello, Rika. Say hello. Talk to her in German a little bit. Hello, Schnule. <laughs> <laughs> um, good. Yeah, good to show. All right. So there you are. She's listening in today. But by the way, since she's your identical twin sister, Doc, is, does Rika have synesthesia? So, long time ago, we talked about it, and we were, I don't know, maybe teenagers, maybe 20s or so. Anyway, we... 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah kind of. Yeah, so, yeah. We, um, mm-hmm. we compared numbers with, with colors, and she had different ones, and so I always thought she's making it up, because obviously, my color number association is the correct one well, naturally so, huh? naturally i mean that's how you just you know it's obvious that one is white it's so flipping obvious so anyway um we haven't talked as old adults so we will do so so lucas so, your son too i sent him out an invitation yeah. to listen in maybe he's listening yeah lucas come tomorrow Woo-hoo. yeah she he, he it's funny she talks to lucas only in german and he never responds back in German, right? He just he just talks to you. He returns. He kind of computes it. Oh, mom. Okay, yeah. The, the house is doing fine. Everything's fine. It's all like Now, does he have anything like synesthesia? I don't think so. I have to ask. He's coming tomorrow, so we'll find out. No, he's coming uh, tom- tomorrow. Tom- tom- tomorrow, <laughs> Thursday. So, <laughs> but before before we leave it, though, interestingly, every musician that I've ever known um, that also claims synesthesia. Um, we hear the same colors for the same keys of music. Every what? single one that I've tested. Every single one. Really? Yeah, oh. Everyone so finds mine is eight. correct and my sister is not correct, obviously. Naturally. Yeah. Yes. All right, Mike Powell. And then, hey, the following week is going to be, uh, the following week is going to be the, the Mighty Steelheads are going to be in here, Frank and Vern and Rob. And I, I forget the drummer's name. I'm sorry. But they will be harmonizing and singing some stuff acoustically and talking about their thing. They come in on the 12th, I think, of... July. They, uh, I'll have to ask uh, Mike Powell and uh, the Mighty Steelheads, and I should have asked the uh, Disturbing the Peace last week, hey, do you guys, do you guys see numbers and colors? And what colors are your numbers? And what notes are your numbers? Or what n- numbers are your colors? Or no, your 
Nope. Oh, forget it. Just, just ask them what F blues tastes like. F, F tastes F like. Oh, taste? taste. Oh my! Oh, one yeah. of our oh, there's, there's a whole no, new world. In oh there. my <laughs> goodness! I forgot about taste. One of our our life. Uh, our we come equipped with a toolbox of our five senses, and many people overlook taste. That's oh, right. It's we, one of the most important, isn't it? Yeah. All well, that olfactory stuff. Which one would you like? Which one could you live without? Oh, sight for sure. What? Oh no! You can, cannot. You would. You would not give up your sight. That's the number one everybody likes. Not to a musician. Wow. Wait a minute! Oh oh stop my that! Gosh. If you were said, you know, the big divine warrior out there in the universe said, "I will take away one of your senses." You're not gonna say, "Take away my sight." Okay. Could you live without scent and taste? Okay. Yes. There's there's only two left after those. Okay. Hearing <laughs> and, and and touch. All right, those are our five toolbox. Mm -hmm. I would take, uh, I could most probably, without scent, you can't taste. Mm -hmm. Well, you can can still. It's somewhat. uh, It's like, what, 65, 70% of? When I broke my nose and had it packed with stuff, I I, I could not taste So you're a hot sauce guy now. Yeah, no, I don't like hot sauce. Hey, there's Ralph. Hey, Ralph, welcome. I mean, (laughs) Ralph, yes. Are you coming back in to give us a cheering section? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How long have you been here? Have you been here for a while? (laughs) Just about 20 minutes. No. I just want to say I lost an eye about three months ago. You lost an eye? I didn't know that. Yeah, and so take my taste away. Right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Take away a couple other things. All please. right, okay. Well, there you go. The touch of feel. The I'm touch of feel. I pulled up to the chop yeah. shop now. Yeah. All right, where are we? We are, oh my God, I got to run. Hey, we are closing this down right now. Let me run back here to the end. I want to say um, thank you guys, both of you, for coming on. This has been an incredible fast yeah, hour. Pleasure. 59 minutes have passed with a minus three that we came in late. Before I turn my microphone over to others here in the KFUG studio, I wish to thank the KFUG station manager, sound engineer, and master of Manifest Destiny, Destiny Paul Kritz, for his work in making this show possible. I'm truly honored to work beside you. Lastly, I wish to thank all the universe, the divine God, or the cosmic powers that be for guiding me to KFUG. I knocked upon a door, and when it opened, I boldly stepped across its threshold. And if I can do it, folks, you can too. Get involved in your community radio station. I can't wait to hear your stories, your trials, your interests, your passions and causes and needs and services and contributions. What else is there? And uh, to the most precious of all of our commodities, the life within each of us and the vortex of love that each of us possess. Follow me on Facebook. It's Jacques Kepner, K-E-P-N-E-R, Jacques, like the French Jack. Or you can look me up as the Singing Florist. Actually, I think I'm on Facebook as the Singing Florist. Reach out to me soon and make sure to tune in next week when we talk to Mike and Teresa Powell. And the week after that, the Mighty Steelheads. All right. Thank you, Dr. D. Great, <laughs> great stuff. We can't wait to hear you this coming Sunday. Thank you. And Dr. G, thank you for coming in on your lunch break and filling in and coming in. And, and you two, we gotta, we got to talk. Do we got to do this again? Sounds like a plan. Thank you. All that right. Peace and love. See you later, Ralph. Take care, everybody. Have a good one. And my lead-out music. All right.